Welcome as you guys are coming in. Excited. excited oops, sorry. Excited to see you guys uh, here. Are you guys jumping in? We got people jumping in. You guys see them? I had to jump onto my phone. Are we good? Okay. Good. Welcome, guys. Uh, super excited. We're talking about pricing. Uh, hot, hot topic, especially right now on everything, uh, you know, whether that's with laundromat stuff or food prices, gas prices, utilities, whatever. Pricing is all the rage right now. We're going to be talking about it uh, today in the context of laundromats and wash, dry, fold service and pickup and delivery. And we're going to talk about how do we think about pricing and how do we navigate pricing while things are changing so, so quickly uh, all around us right now. And so uh, super excited because uh, nobody wants to hear what I think about pricing. What I did was I jumped on with Sense and we got a couple of experts. And so super excited to introduce you to the panelists we have today. Uh, first of all, we have Gilly, who you guys have probably seen around and you've probably met before. But if you haven't, let me just tell you a little bit about uh, Gilly, who is the co-founder, chief product officer of Sense. Uh, Gilly, is it is it Sharon? Sean? Sharon, we got it. Sharon. All right. Awesome. Gilly Sharon, uh, who's chief product officer of Sense, uh, is a product leader with a passion for building companies from the ground up, experience and scaling products. Uh, from the first feature to industry defining businesses, Gilly's a seasoned founder. Excited to see how the Sense product can empower and inspire the laundromat industry into a new era that needs some like epic music behind it. But uh, basically, what that means is Sense, it, or, uh, Gilly is with Sense trying to help you guys succeed in your business uh, through developing superior products. So, what's up, Gilly? How's it going, man? Everything's good. Good to be here. Excited to talk about pricing. Uh, very excited to hear everybody chime in about pricing because I think we need to also hear from from everybody listening in as well. Yeah, absolutely. And be uh, communicating in the chat over there. We want to be answering your questions. But uh, before we really jump into it, I want to introduce you to the other panelists we have today, which is Brian. Is it Smolin or Smolin? Smolin, you got it. Smolin, awesome. Uh, uh, so Brian actually owns Laundromat, uh, owner of Laundromax and account executive at Sense. Brian has spent the majority of his career in corporate America, working in corporate strategy and finance at both large companies and startups. After investing in apartment buildings across New England, started looking for his next investment. After going down a rabbit hole of small business ventures, he came out the other side with the decision not only to acquire a laundromat, but to do a full build. Uh, so Brian has done what so many of you either have to also done or are wanting to do, which is escape the rat race, escape that nine to five, the corporate grind and uh, own his own business. So Brian, what's up, man? How you doing? Awesome. Glad to be here. Excited to uh, talk to everyone today. Yeah, it's going to be going to be great. And I love having uh, both of you guys here on board with this coming from two different kind of perspectives. Um, but what I love about uh, having both of you guys here is that um, you guys both see uh, a whole bunch of different perspectives from all over the country, really. Um, and then Brian, obviously, in the trenches also uh, with his own business. So uh, super excited about this. Uh, I don't know. You guys ready to kick this thing off? Are we good? Let's do it. Awesome. Let's do it. Uh, well, OK, let's. Let's let's throw you a little bit of a softball here just to kind of kick us off. But a lot of people feel bad about raising prices. We're going to go straight to the raising of prices, right? A lot of people feel bad about that. Uh, can you guys maybe uh, talk us through how do you think about pricing and raising prices? And is it OK? Should I feel bad? Should I not feel bad? How do you think about that? What? In what way do you frame this in your own mind to, to figure out how, how to raise prices, but also how to feel about raising prices? Brian, you want to kick us off? Yeah, sure. Um, I don't think it's ever a bad thing to raise prices. The reason being is that when we go to the supermarket, when we go to the gas station, nobody is giving us a heads up that prices are being raised. Unfortunately, it's a function of the environment we're in today. So I think to provide an ongoing quality service to your customers, that it does require 
us to raise our prices to what the market dictates. So, I mean, everyone knows inflation is an ongoing thing right now. I think last time the report came out was eight and a half percent. I also think what some people don't realize is that doesn't even include your food or energy costs. I mean, we're in the laundromat industry. Energy is a huge chunk of our expenses, and that's not even factored in what that inflation number is. So it's actually much higher, especially for people like us. So unfortunately, whether we want to or not, you need to be comfortable raising your prices so that you continue to provide that service to your customers. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think that energy costs, I mean, you know, the, it's funny, I, you know, I see that eight and a half, 8.6, whatever it is, uh, inflation number thrown around a lot. But, you know, the things that we're spending money on all the time are all over that 8% number. Most of them are over that 20% number, whether that's, you know, all our utilities, like you said, we're in the energy business, right? So, you know, that's well, just utilities in general, the natural gas prices, our gasoline prices, our food costs, all that stuff. Almost all that stuff is well over that eight and a half percent that we're spending money on all the time. So yeah, interesting. Gilly, what's your, uh, what's your thought process around this? Yeah. So first of all, I really like the fact that this industry has such anxiety around raising prices because like Brian said, you know, nobody gives a heads up at the gas station, right? But one thing that's so great about laundromats and laundromat owners is our connection to our community, or not ours, I'm not a laundromat owner, but I'll just say our, um, our connection to our communities and our dedication to our customers and the loyalty we feel to our customers. And so it feels very personal when we want to go ahead and start raising prices. And it gives us, you know, some stress around that and some additional stress that it was really this black and white decision making process we might not feel. And then of course, there's all this fear around, okay, my competitors, if I raise prices, I'm going to lose business. And that seems to be the, the, the biggest scare. And, you know, the more and more I hear it, the more and more I hear everybody scream, nope, that didn't happen. Nope, that didn't happen. And so I think it just behooves us to lean into what our business needs. Now, should you raise your price? And how much you should raise your prices? Is that machine prices or wash and fold prices? I think those things are, um, I think those things are, are, are really dependent on where you're trying to take your business. And I think that there's a lot to talk about on, on that and kind of how pricing relates to a strategy decision, not necessarily just, um, you know, it, it, more, more strategic as opposed to just, you know, I need to raise my prices because I need to make the bottom, the, the bottom line. Yeah, love that. Uh, okay, so I want to just uh, take a quick pause and just let you all know, number one, like, Hey, I've got some questions to throw at these guys. We're going to have some discussions and stuff, but really what we're mostly interested in helping you guys at where you're at with your businesses. So, you know, that's the goal of this thing. So we can talk about whatever we want to talk about, but if it's not going to help you guys. We're not interested in doing that really. So if you have questions, if you have input about, you know, some of the things that we're talking about, put that stuff in the chat because I've, I've found that in, in these types of webinars, there's a lot of value that, and a lot of valuable conversations that happen in the chat. So questions directly for any of the three of us, or uh, if you want to input, um, you know, have input on what we're talking about, use that chat. That is going to make this thing so much more valuable for you guys. Uh, and so make sure you're doing that. Um, and also just a quick note on that. Make sure you hit the little drop down box and click uh so that everyone can see it, not just hosts and panelists. Okay. So I know a couple of you guys have sent stuff in to just the host and panelists. So uh, yeah, put them in the, put them in the chat that that'll just be fine. And that'll be easy. Um, and I'll just keep an eye on that chat. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Um, one question that just came in, I thought was a really good one. Whoop. Uh, sorry. I had to go onto my phone because my internet connection was bad and I was not prepared for that. Okay. So, uh, you know, a question that came in is, um, okay, we're not really afraid of raising prices. Uh, however, we're curious to know what others use as justification or baseline for price increases and how to compare new prices to local competition in a healthy way. Um, okay. So how do you, I, I mean, the question uses justification. First of all, let me just ask, do we need to justify our price increases? Um, I think probably some people say yes, some people say no, but what do you guys think? Do we need to justify price increases? I would err on the side that you're, 
standard price increase on an annual or biannual basis, you do not need justification for. Let's take all of the majority of the people on this call have rented at some point in their life. When that lease is up and their landlord increases it that three, three, four percent, nothing's changed. The experience you're receiving from your landlord is no different, but it's as things go on, things get more expensive. So you don't necessarily need to justify it in with larger hikes or things like that. Sure, you want to make sure you're giving it back to them with regards to the level of value that they're receiving. But I don't think that it necessarily has to be this hard justification that that I'm raising this dryer 25 cents <laughs> washer that we need to give explanation around it. Gilly, you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that when we get done, when we start going down the rabbit hole of justifying that price, I think we're, 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 we're going away from the question we really should be asking, which is what is the value I'm providing, like Brian said? And our price should match the value we provide and your customer should feel that. It shouldn't be the value that we think we provide, it's the value that they actually experience. And if the value they actually experience is good, then we should go ahead and price accordingly. Yeah. I like that. And I mean, I, th I think the value discussion gets thrown around and maybe today we can actually talk about that a little bit and like, how do we make sure, or like, how do we, how do we determine the value of the services that we provide? Cause I think that's a, you know, to be honest, I've been a part of a lot of these kind of discussions, both formally and stuff like this and informally. And I think that gets left out a lot is like, okay, well, how do we determine how much value we're providing? Uh, but real quick, going back to what Brian was saying, I kind of like, uh, where you were heading with your answer, not a kind of like, I really like it. And, you know, one of the, one of the things that you said that you kind of glossed over is if everybody's doing it, but they're not. So I wanted to kind of go back and point it out is that there's, you know, you mentioned almost kind of breaking it into two kind of categories of price raises, the, the annuals or biannual or whatever it is, your regular rhythmic price increases, which you said, you don't really need to justify. That's just like a normal, sort of price increase. And so, I, I mean, I really like that. And and not everybody is doing that. And if you're in a situation where you've owned a laundromat for a long time and you'll, you know, you kind of look around and, and are like, you know what, I haven't really actually raised prices in a while. Might be good to kind of get in that rhythm of raising it, you know, annually or, or twice a year or whatever. Um, and then, and then, you know, that kind of uh, implies that there's another category of price increases, which I think we've been kind of in the middle of uh, recently where we've, we're seeing utility prices kind of across the country, you know, go through the roof and particularly natural gas, but like a lot of our utility costs are going through the roof and that's caused, you know, you, I've seen discussions on it online on different forums on Facebook groups and stuff where people are raising their prices every other month or every three months or, or whatever um, to kind of keep pace with, those utility costs, right? And those are sort of outside of your normal every day, every year or twice a year um, increases. Do we need to offer an explanation for those types of things um, or, or not? If people no. ask, I mean, as owners of these small businesses, a lot of us are in the store more time than we want to be. But if somebody asks, absolutely, like you could say, well, listen, this is what's going on. I mean, as you know, everything's up. We feel the same pressures. And realistically, even when people are increasing those prices, I can guarantee you, they're not probably passing it on one to one. So even with them feeling guilty that, okay, I'm increasing this, like our dryers, we don't make money on, get natural gas is through the roof. So realistically, to price our dryers to where they should be, probably be at a dollar for every five minutes. So it's just a matter of recouping it to an extent that you could still maintain your margins. Yeah, I think the, the answer there is right, we have to be fair. And I think that if we raise prices that go along with the market changes, then we're being then we're being fair. And to Ryan's point, we're probably all and a lot of us probably underselling um, compared to what we should be doing in an effort not to kind of create too much shift uh, so quickly as we're seeing the market seeing happen in the market. Um, but, but yeah, I think we have to, I think in order for us to stay in business and for us to grow and think about our strategies, I think we have to have pricing that allows us to stay in business. Yeah. Uh, well, and 
you know, along the same veins, I mean, we've been talking kind of generically uh, about adjusting prices, but along the same vein and a little more specifically uh, with pick and delivery, the question that came in, uh, curious to hear how people address price adjustment with pickup and delivery services. Do you include it in the price or as an add on to the price list? So I'm assuming, you know, they're asking, you know, if you're if you're offering more value, uh, do you include it in there or do you offer it as sort of like a an add on to your to your services? That's that's my assumption. Clarify if you ask that question, clarify if I'm not getting that right. But uh, what do you guys think about that? Brian, what do you think? Um, I've actually, it's a great question. I've actually just been toying with this over the last two months. So up till this month, I've had it included. And then this, and then starting in June, I broke it out. I have seen a dip in the amount, but I was also just more of an experimental thing. And I think that at the end of the day, the consumer, whether it's us staying at a hotel, an Airbnb, or going to a laundromat, you like the all-in number. Like when you book that Airbnb, you're like, okay, this is $150 a night. And then you get hit with all those other fees. You don't like that feeling. People like simplicity. You go to Costco, the reason why they're so successful, you have three options. They don't carry 50 versions of something. So I think the same thing applies in this where it's okay. The, what you see is what you get. If it's $1.50 a pound for, for pickup and delivery, you know that I'm all in for dollar fifty pound. That includes everything. Simplistic makes it easy. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in here. I, I, I totally agree. I think that we see that simple pricing is is the easiest, and that's a that's a big question mark. And I also think that how do we keep it simple for our customers, even though it's a little bit more complicated for 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 us, maybe the operator, maybe I own more than one store and need to have different. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Now okay. you're back. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, um, so anyway, so I think that the differentiating pricing, I think, you know, by store, by market is really, really important for us to make sure that we're keeping track of how much money we're making per laundromat, per, per pickup and delivery for walk-in customers versus delivery customers. We need to have a lot of visibility into that, but for our end customer, we need to keep that as simple as possible. And I think that software can really help open, open this up a little bit. How do I think about pricing in general, right? Because we can talk about pickup and delivery. We can talk about self-serve. We can talk about walk-in. We can talk about commercial customers. We can talk about commercial customers that are sending me this much volume versus this much volume. And so having flexibility to differentiate your pricings across the different types of customers that we serve, I think is really, really important going back to value, right? Our prices should equate to value, right? If we're providing X value to the commercial customer or Y value to that pickup and delivery customer, then our pricing should reflect that in a fair way that where everybody feels like they're getting what they, what they bought. Um, and, and, we, and we can feel the same way as the seller. Um, happy to dive in more into the mechanics of that, but I'll stop there. Yeah, and one of the things I'll add to that is that you can actually, you can actually steer customers to what is what is best for you and them, uh, you know, at the same time through your pricing model, especially if you're able to keep it simplistic. You know, you think about like a Seven Eleven or something where they or McDonald's or whatever they have you know, three sizes, small, medium, large or whatever. And you got your small is a dollar 59, a medium is a dollar 79 and a large or extra large is a dollar 89, right? It's like, well, if I'm going to get a medium, I might as well just get a large. It's 10 cents more, right? And you're able to kind of just say, hey, this is going to be better. You're going to get more, you know, well, it's debatable whether getting more soda is better for you or not. But you know what I mean? Like you're going to get more and it's really not going to cost you all that much. Well, you can do similar things, you know, with your business. If you offer, you know, a wash, dry, fold and you offer a pickup and delivery, well, a lot of times, you know, people are, would rather have, you know, a pickup and delivery customer than a wash, dry, fold because they can, you know, add a little margin. Well, instead of, you know, dropping your price for your pickup and delivery, you can actually increase, bump up your price a little bit for your wash, dry, fold and sort of steer people towards that pickup and delivery um, so you can expand that side of your business. Um, and, you know, if they're going to do their 
you know, if they're going to do their drop off service with you, their wash drive fold with you at a dollar 25 a pound. Well, if you make it like a dollar 35, dollar 40, and it's a dollar 50 to get it picked up and delivered to you, well, man, that's almost like a no brainer, to, you know, to do the pickup and delivery. So you can actually, by keeping it simple um, and, and limiting the options, you can actually direct people, you know, to something that's better for you and for them. Uh, because, you know, having your laundry pick up and delivered to you and done for you is a lot better for you than buying the extra large soda. So, <laughs> yeah. And I, I, to I totally agree with that. And I think that we can play with pricing. And I think that, you know, obviously I'm coming from the software perspective, so I'm going to lean heavy on that. But I think that software can provide the, the, the mechanics for us to be able to differentiate those prices for pickup and delivery versus walk-in while keeping that experience really simple. And I also think that offering differentiated services and wonder what you think about this, because you, you gave the soda example where I can actually incentivize the more, you know, sometimes we want to not incentivize, right? Maybe somebody wants same day service, which is not something I can take on a whole bunch of because I can't handle that level of volume. So I'm going to super increase the price. So the only people who really need that same day service are going to actually take it while everyone else is going to plan out the processing, right? Because so much of this game is running it profitably. Sure, if we go ahead and we do, and we have our pricing as X, Y, and Z, because we feel like that's the fair price for the value we provide, then we have to go ahead and commit to that and get the processing done in a way that keeps us, you know, that, that keeps us profitable. Um, so, so yeah, I think that it can go both ways and we can use pricing to kind of push the different services that we want to sell uh, over, the, over the counter or, or, or over the phone. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, I, I think, like I was kind of saying, I guess it, it, like you're saying, it works both ways, right? If you want people, you, you can steer people with your pricing to what you want them to do. And the same goes on like the self-serve side, right? Like if you want them to be using larger machines, uh, you know, you can price your smaller machines higher. You see a lot of people doing this with their top loaders, right? Like your 20 pounders are, you know, like $3 to do a load. And then you got top loaders that you really don't want your customers using and you put them at 350 or four bucks. And the people who really want to use it, they're going to pay the extra to do it. And yeah. the rest of the people are going to go use those twenties. Right. And so yeah. you can kind of steer people where you want them to go, whether that's the self-serve side, the wash dry fold side. Uh, and, and, you know, one example on the wash dry fold side is the uh, you know, the people who offer like a wash dry bag uh, yeah. option where it cuts out the folding and the folding is the, the majority of the labor for, for most wash dry fold services. Right. And so by, incentivizing a wash dry bag, you know, you can, uh, you, you can really cut down your labor time and your labor costs by offering that service and pricing it accordingly uh, as well. Totally. If, you, if you're on the brink of needing to add another unit of labor in order to handle the volume, introducing a wash dry bag option might go ahead and have some of those people opt for that solution, which would mean you can go ahead and push off adding additional labor to the, to the mat um, at, any, at any given time. Another comment I just saw in the comments here, and I want to call it out because I think it's a really, really good idea, is the ability to increase the minimum pounds on a per order basis for delivery orders, where you can maintain a single price per pound, right? But you just say, hey, but I'm going to do pickup and delivery. I'm going to eat that cost of pickup and delivery. I'm going to go ahead and make sure that my, my orders are at least X big. Now, a lot of times, most of your orders meet those minimums. But if they don't, you start losing money. Let's go ahead and increase those minimums to make sure we do that. And that way, your branding, your storefront, all these things can say the same $1.50 a pound, even though pickup and delivery might have some differentiation on, on, on the minimums, which I think is another good way to do it. I spoke to an operator today um, who did just that. He said, hey, has, has, has this impacted your pricing for pickup and delivery? And he said, not the core price, but I increased my minimum. So that's a good, that's a nice idea. Uh, the other side to this is, and it's just a matter of the market in which you operate in. Like for me, I do offer wash dry bag. That said, I do not like when people use it because of the fact that that's part of the experience. When you come to my store, no matter who folds it, you get it back in the exact same way in the nice, neat looking uh, clear plastic bags inside of your um, laundry bag with it shaped very rectangularly, folded, all drawer ready. That is part of the experience. That's part of what you're paying for. If I'm just returning it back to you in a 
bag that's just stuffed, no folding, that visual satisfaction is no longer there. And I think all of us could agree. Nobody minds doing laundry. Nobody minds putting in the washer, putting in the dryer. Everyone hates folding and putting it away. I will literally mm -hmm. do laundry here on my laundromat, bring it home, and let it sit in my laundry bag for two weeks. So it's not the wash and dry portion. It's the folding and putting it away that people are outsourcing. Yeah, that goes back to the same conversation around value, right? If we offer a wash dry bag, are we are we robbing ourselves of providing the value that people really want, making them question the service that they're buying anyway? I think that's an important point. I think we need to know our customers, right? You know, when you see, you know, everyone needs to be in their laundromat talking with their talking with their customers on a regular basis to know what's going to work. And I think the core of pricing is what's right for your specific area. Yeah, and I think I think it's just like food, we eat with our eyes. So like I went as far as um, like comforters. I didn't realize, especially up in the Northeast when you're in areas that are change of season, comforters are a huge, huge thing. I charge an astronomical amount for comforters compared to the people around me. I'm at $25 for a king and queen comforter basic. Whereas the three within a mile of me are probably at around 12 to $15. The way I justify that is, is because I fold it all extremely neat. I put a ribbon around it with our logos on it and I put it in a bag and push out the air. I was toying between getting comforter bags that have a little zipper like when you go to Macy's and getting vacuum sealed bags. Both is an extremely cool and way to differentiate yourself but I went with the comforter bags because visually the vacuum seal bag is probably more practical because you're putting it away in your closet for three to six months. But when you pick it up, it doesn't look visually appealing. So when you pick it up in a comforter bag, mm -hmm. visually it looks awesome. So yeah. even just little things like that, I think play into it. Yeah. And I know this has been a really hot topic in general and, 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 and Brian's hitting on this is how do we communicate value? Right. Putting it in a comfort bag, put it in a, you know, put it in a, you know, put a little ribbon on it, put it, put it back in a shoe box. Shout out to a lead on, on the, on the, on the panel, on the comments here. I think that those things and how we communicate value is really important. And just to shout out software one more time, how do we communicate that, that value even before the processing happens? How do we make it clear to the customer how their laundry will be done? What is the, what is the baseline preferences that the laundromat will do your laundry? If I don't tell them anything, how much customization do we allow the customer? How much transparency into their order, into their order do we allow the customer? And these things, these are value things, right? And these are things that people are willing to pay more for. Maybe they want to pay more for it because as you start to provide more value, you can increase your prices as long as you're communicating that value, even in a pre-order situation. Yeah. And, and I'll just point out too, just to piggyback on that, communicating is not just, you know, like a verbal communication or a text or an email. It's also, I mean, just exactly what Brian was saying. It's that presentation. It's, you know, like you mentioned, <clears throat> Walid is king of the little things, you know, to add value. He'll just rattle off, you know, thing after thing after thing that those guys do. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, you know, demonstrating that value you know, by the presentation and by the, you know, the consistency, all that stuff is just as important. Um, and, you know, I, I want to say, I don't want to give Waleed too much credit here, but I want to say I heard Waleed say, but almost like, you know, your goal should be to, to make your product Instagrammable, right? Like after you get it back, if, and, and that goes back to Brian's point of going with the comforter, uh, bags, you know, as opposed to the vacuum drive, because it just doesn't look as nice, it's not visually appealing. They look all shriveled and, you know, whatever lumpy. Uh, but, you know, making it shareable, making it like, oh my gosh, did you see, you know, how, you know, Brian's uh, laundromat, you know, delivered my, my comforter back to me. Like, this is pretty crazy. I've never seen anybody do that before. Right. And that, that all of a sudden becomes shareable. And that's how you start building, your business up and demonstrating your value there. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. I think that's so important. And I think it's also important to note here that it's not about the gimmick, right? That the comforter bag is not about just the comforter bag. The comforter bag is representative 
to the love that we provide, that we give into the orders that we process and the effort that we give into, into these process, it goes back to how do we treat our employees? How do we pay our employees? How do we incentivize our employees? Because in a service industry, if we're doing wash, dry, fold, you know, the product that we do is only as good as the person doing the processing, right? Of course, you need a commercial washer dryer, but really it's, 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 it's the labor that goes into it. And so how do we go and keep that labor providing a high quality product, right? And then how do we communicate that? So I think the Instagram is great. The, 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 all the, you know, the comforter bags, whatever it is, is great. But those are tools to represent the effort that goes into it, not to get you one more like on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I want to go uh, real quick back to, I think Madison who asked, uh, so you're saying wash drive full customers, we should do something like a dollar 20, pick them delivery, do something like a dollar 40. Uh, and you know, the concept is yes, you want to have two different prices for walk-in and drop off. Um, but, but the actual pricing depends, you know, it depends on a lot of things like we're talking about here. It depends on the value that you offer. Uh, but it also depends on what you want your customers to do. There may be scenarios where you would rather people drop off their laundry and not like maybe you're getting close to your, I have to add another car and driver uh, if I, you know, if I add too much more pick them delivery business. And so you want to encourage people to do, you know, to bring it in to you, you know, um, or to use a software like Sense to, you know, uh, do third party uh, do third-party drivers to, to bring it to you so you can operate it like that, right? And you can use your pricing. It's it's kind of like the government, right? Like the government incentivizes what they want us to do by giving us tax breaks for building businesses, for, you know, owning rental properties, you know, all this stuff, these incentives. It's just the government telling us what they want us to do, and we behave accordingly because they've incentivized that, right? And we can do the same with our customers by incentivizing you know, what you want them to do, whether that's pick them delivery or wash, dry, fold or self-serve or use larger machines or use smaller machines or, you know, to do wash, dry bag or to not do wash, dry bag, you know, which I loved, uh, you know, that perspective. And somebody, I think Daryl said, you know, they actually do their own laundry and then they just bring their pile of laundry to the laundromat to have it folded. So there's the other side of it, right? Um, and that's case in point to you. Everybody hates folding. Nobody cares about washing. Everybody hates folding. Right. And so offering a, Hey, we do, we have a folding service. Right. And if you want people to do that because your attendants have downtime, you know, you can incentivize that. Right. And so utilizing pricing as a tool can be really powerful. And I actually, I mean, to be honest with you, like I said, I've been in a lot of these discussions and I don't hear anybody talking about pricing in those terms, yeah. really. I hear like, how much do we charge? How do we determine Right. what we charge, which are good questions to have, but I don't really hear anybody talking about, uh, yeah, Brian Reisland plus one for, for fold only. Yeah. Uh, I don't hear anybody talking about how it can be a powerful tool for us, um, to, to direct customers, yeah. you know, where we want them. I think we need to change the conversation around pricing around from how much to how can I go ahead and use this as a means to an end? I totally agree. Um, that, that needs to shift. And I would also love, I don't know, um, you know, so a couple of things that you mentioned, the, the gig economy, if you don't want to go ahead and buy a, buy a driver, obviously the gig economy has a cost to it. There are people picking up and delivering, picking up and delivering laundry. One of the things that we do, and I also think that transparency with pricing is valuable, right? And so one of the things that we, we allow our operators to do is to subsidize however much that costs so their customer doesn't eat the entire fee, right? So maybe you increase your minimums, you increase your per pound fee, you offer a lower on-demand delivery fee because you've decided as an operator to eat some of that cost that you're recouping from the higher price. Cool. But now we're actually show that to the end customer. So they see, oh, this is being subsidized by the provider. They're subsidizing the pickup and delivery because they want to share in that cost with me. And I think that helps frame things for people, right? It's like nobody wants to see these miss these fees that don't make any sense. But the minute you sit down with somebody and say, look, this is why we do the service fee. The waiter did this and the bartender did that and whatever it is. The minute you demystify those fees, I think people are generally more comfortable with them and, and, and happier to continue to doing business because they feel some degree of trust that you've, that you've established with them. Yeah. Well, and it brings up, you know, going back to uh, the pickup and delivery side of things, one of the questions that came up is, hey, you know, I want to offer free pickup and delivery, but obviously, 
you know, with labor costs and then gasoline costs and all that stuff going up, uh, you, it's not free, right? You can't offer it for free. So right. is it better uh, to to offer free pickup and delivery but build the cost in? Or is it better to to charge and say, hey, you know, we do pickup and delivery at this price and the pickup and delivery fee is X amount. You guys have any thoughts on that, Brian? Um, I'm a big fan of just all encapsulated. It's same thing like, I will find something on Amazon that's slightly more expensive than something on a different website. And because it's free delivery or it's included, I will pay for it. I mean, I can't tell you how many times, and I think we've all done it. You will spend more money to get to qualify for that free delivery threshold than just buying the $25 item, paying the $10 delivery. But no, we will all spend the $50 to get free delivery. So in in turn, we're spending $15 more to get, quote unquote, something for free. So people like, I'll go back to the end, people want, want simplicity, that all in one. I know that this is all I'm paying for. I know I saw in the comments about the washing bag. As soon as my bags get in from China off the boat, I will absolutely be trying that because I think it's just, again, it goes back to that. People know that that bag sitting in their living room I don't need to think about, oh, what's that going to cost? I just know it's sitting there. That's $35 if I fill it up halfway or if I fill it up all the way. So I think that's also ways to bring value. I know that's a big, if you go on any of these forms, people love to argue which way, whether per pound or per bag, but I'm 100% going to be trying that. Yeah, I, I, my, my comment on that is I don't have an answer. I see, oh, I see both. I see people, you know, baking it into the cost. I see people charging for it. I see people doing like free with my own drivers subsidized if they have, if, they, if they're leveraging the gig economy. Um, so we see a lot of different permutations. And I think it goes back to like, we see it in, in all other industries too, right? You can buy, I can't think of a good example. So excuse me, you can buy an all exclusive fancy plane ticket on whatever airlines that you get, you know, that you get a meal and a drink and whatever. And then you go to the, you know, the low end, you know, airlines where you don't even get an armrest unless you pay for it or whatever, right? And I think both of those business models work. I think it's just a matter of what are you, you know, going back to our earlier discussion, Jordan, around like, who do you want to be in the market, right? I think it's about who do you want to be? What value are you communicating to your customers? And if you're doing a good job at communicating, then you're setting expectations. And then the last thing I'll say around, around pricing is that when you make things free, taking away free becomes very difficult. And so if it ever becomes something you want to play with in the future, Right, you want to increase your delivery cost by a buck. If it was already a dollar and now it's two dollars, maybe that's a little bit easier, something to swallow than if it was free and now you start charging for it. Um, I know a lot of you know a lot of our operators were you know for for self serve customers were giving away free soap and they can't afford to give away free soap anymore. And there's this tension because it was free and now it's a cost as a, as opposed to slightly more expensive. Um, so I think that's another thing to consider on flexibility with pricing into the future. Yeah, I love that. So how do we, if, if we're going to bake it in, how do we, how do we determine how much to bake in? Uh, because I, I mean, I think that's a, a big question. I think that was the, the, que the intent of the question. Um, so how do we determine how much, how, well, or just pricing in general, like for pickup and delivery services or wash dry folds, or how do we determine how much we should be charging uh, for those I think those are that's broken out to two buckets. And this gets me crazy when I see them on some of the forums is like just blanket questions. What are you charging for a wash and fold? What do you what do you charge what do you price your 80 pound washers at? Where that is such a market specific thing that me telling you that I charge twelve fifty for an 80 pounder being in New York is really irrelevant to what you're charging in the Midwest or what yours is. Even I mean to me, I think what you charge in store is almost irrelevant to what your competitors are charging around you. The reason why I say that is because, I mean, I'm in a densely populated area in the suburbs on Long Island. So within a mile of me, there's three, three, four of the lunch rats. Within three, within three miles, there's five or six. I have no problem being the most expensive. The reason being is that when you walk in, you're getting that experience. There's not many businesses out there 
where I'm getting a customer to spend up to two hours of their time in my space. So if I'm able to just knock it, knock it out of the park with the experience they're getting in my store, whether it be AC, nice music, TV is playing, free coffee and donuts on Saturdays, things like that, that gives me the ability to charge the price I'm charging. It also comes down to what my PL is. The guy around the corner that runs a place that I would never ever wash my clothes in is going to have a drastically different PL than what mine is as a newly built store. So I can't be competing with that. That's not my target market. That's not what I'm going after. It's first whatever your financials dictate, and then you could play from there. I think on the other side, your pickup and delivery, that's something that to an extent I think is market driven because the fact that they're not coming into my store, I can't blow them out of the water with that value just yet. They could see my website, they could see pictures, but they can't look and touch and see how clean and nice everything is. So I think with that, that's more so on what is the market and then over time, maybe increasing your, your price on that. So that's where I think it's two very different approaches and methodologies to how you want to price those two services. Yeah. I'll also add that I think, and, and Jordan, you might have some insights on this as well, but my experience is that people who have been offering pickup and delivery in this space have, have really been pushing the free pickup and delivery. It's on most vans that I see drive by. It's a big value sell, right? And I think that's kind of consistent with where pickup and delivery was in the last you know, couple decades. Um, and now with the onset of all these new services where delivery is not included, right, unless you buy Amazon Prime, right? So memberships is a really interesting mechanism here that we can talk to to kind of play with pricing and incentivize loyalty, right? But I think that we're moving into a world with, with you know, with food delivery, with whatever delivery that um, there is a fee. It's there in the summary and it costs money. And, you know, do we as an industry need to also start to think about those shifts and keep up with some of those general consumer trends and not lock ourselves into something a little bit more, a um, little bit more uh, traditional. Touching on the free, I don't understand why people get so hung up on it. To yeah. me, it's it's a marketing term. Free is there's no such thing as free. It's a fugazi. It's not real. It's coming somewhere. There is no nothing that's free in this industry. It's getting shifted somewhere. It's just an easier way of categorizing it. I just don't get it. There's no need to get hung up on free. It's not free. It's paid for somewhere. It's just a matter of where you make it in. It just looks better on a van when it says free delivery from right. a marketing and branding perspective than price all included. Right. You can't market that. So that, that's really what it comes about. It's just not something to get held up on. You need to figure out what your cost of your business are and set your pricing accordingly regardless of what people around you are pricing. Because clearly if you built out a new store in a location, you see that you're bringing value there. So there's something there. You're, you're differentiating yourself, but you think you can. If you're buying a store that's pre-existing, well, you're going to be able to either do a value add, retool, whatever it is, and create that value that will justify that price. But free doesn't exist. I don't like yeah. the term. It's it's not it's not a real thing. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, just like you said, it's a marketing term. Whether it's free dry, whether it's free pickup and delivery, whether it's free stimulus check, uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's all uh, it's coming from somewhere. Like you said, there is no such thing. Free free college tuition, whatever. Uh, so, but you know, I mean, I, I I love that, and I think it is like more of a marketing decision than anything else, right? And figuring out what's going to help you sell your services because uh, that's what you're trying to do. And I think that's why the free pickup and delivery thing is so uh, so big and why you're seeing it on all the vans uh, because, you know, the, the you know, sell uh, what free is, is the number one word that sells or, or something like that. I've heard that quote. Uh, and so, you know, that, that's that's where you know you're trying to bake in that value into it, right? But you're you're pricing accordingly, and there is no free. Love that. Um, how you know? And maybe Brian, you can you can jump into this on a you know on a your personal business. 
level, and then maybe Gilly, you can you can chime in on this more broadly. But how how do you go about thinking about labor costs and uh, employee costs as you're you know determining pricing, especially now? I mean, we talked about how the price of everything's going up, and labor is no exception to that. Uh, cost of labor has been going up pretty dramatically lately. So how do we factor that in when it comes to pricing? Um, the way I go about it is I'm more on the liberal side with it, with regards to I view not just one customer, I view them as a lifetime customer. It's not just one visit. It's how many visits can I get out of them? So with me, I think in New York, I don't even know what minimum wage is by me because I don't pay it. I start people at $15 an hour and after 90 days, it goes to 18. The justification for that is I expect them to give an unbelievable blowout experience to my customers. Like they better be everything spotless. Hi, how are you? Knowing them on a first name basis, things like that. So that's what I'm paying for. Also, if you want to pay minimum wage and that's how you want to do it, or if you want to pay off the books, I will never tell somebody how to run their business. But I think the quality of customer service you get out of your employee is a function of that, of what you're paying. So with me, I would much rather pay an extra $3 an hour, which probably comes out to maybe $3,000 over the course of a year for that part-time employee, which is nothing. You have people now that are spending $50, $60 every two weeks in your laundromat. And if they're staying there for two years, whatever, I do not want to lose that one person. If I lose one person, then I didn't save anything on underpaying my staff. So with me, it's all about providing the best experience to your employees and their quality of work. Because realistically, when you think about it, working in a laundromat is not that bad. I mean, our entire business is made up of if we could get our machines to run 30% of the day, we're crushing. If you could get above that, you're a rock star. So it's pretty much the same exact thing with how much time they're putting into working. I mean, they do have a lot of downtime and I'm okay with that as long as everything is, again, a type customer service, all of that. So there's no reason why they should want to work in a laundromat like mine versus in a McDonald's where, yeah, you might make a dollar or two more, but you're on your feet all day long. You're in a hot place. You're, you're in a rough environment compared to what it is to work in a laundromat. Yeah, you're working with hangry people. McDonald's, you don't want to do that. <laughs> Gilly, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think Brian, Brian said it really, really, really well. And I think that this is one of the biggest things facing, and this is the biggest question facing our industry as, as costs of labor go up and our desire to offer a higher quality product. And to Brian's point, it's not just about the comforter bag, right? It's about the, the relationship that we build with those customers, the hello, how are you? And if we can afford it, right? I'm not here to speak for everybody's business and everybody's bottom line and everybody's you know, inputs, but the price we charge is an input that will allow us to go ahead and support whatever labor costs we can support. But let's not undervalue a happy, happy employee. Um, you know, Working at a laundromat traditionally ha wasn't necessarily the, the sexiest job in the world. And so we see a lot of turnover, right? Retention at laundromats isn't great. Um, you know, we, we see it on the forums, we see it in a lot of different industries. And how do we go ahead and keep the employees that we like and the employees that are doing a great job? Of course, we have to incentivize them. Financial incentives are, 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 are the obvious one um, and the one we're talking about, but there are lots of ways to think about making the, the job a good job. And so I think absolutely we need to be focused on the quality, um, the quality that our employees provide our end customers um, and, our, and our pricing has to reflect that. Yeah. And I think like at the end of the day, like we're all doing this because we want to make a healthy profit and it's all inputs to that. It's like the one plus one equals three approach, where if you have a happy cut, if you have a happy employee, they're providing great customer service. You have customers that are returning. Like there's no value to a customer that comes one and done. There is zero, zero value to that. They might as well not even be a customer. It's that person that comes every single week, like clock. That's where you're running an awesome business. And that's where us as operators are make, making a good living and things like that. So to me, it's yes, it's, it's the cost of, of getting that out of the business. And I think some people look at it as this is just an expense. 
your software is an expense. Your machines are an expense. Your, your headcount is an expense. And that's the wrong way to look at it, where it's this is something that allows me to drive higher revenue. If I have great customer service, that now justifies the prices you're paying in my, in my store. Yeah, that's huge. And, you know, that that mindset shift is is tough. I get people a lot in my consulting who are like, man, aren't utility costs, you know, aren't they aren't they pretty high for a laundromat? And I'm like, well, yeah, but I mean, you you want you want your utility costs to go up. Not well, not if prices are going up by like 30 percent, but you want you want to increase your usage, your utility usage, because that means your business is going up. Right. That means. You know, it, and, and so shifting that mindset, you know, from, yeah, you know, it might it might cost you some money to buy new machines or to pay employees a little bit more, but it's not an expense. It's an investment in your business. Right. And, you know, it's all these things that add up to equal value. Right. It's the it's the, you know, paying for a top tier employee. It's the utilizing machines that are you know, that are newer, they're not going to break down, they're consistent, you know, they're going to be efficient. It's the comforter bag. It's the, what Waleed does like lavender or something in his, you know, in his stuff, or, you know, it's all the things that add up to equal value. It's not just one thing. And one thing that I would say is that, that if you're going to go the value uh, based route, which I think is probably the best route and, has the longest runway for success if you go the value-based route with your pricing and your customer experience and all that stuff, then it's a never-ending pursuit, right? It's not a, hey, okay, I, I, I solved the value equation. I pay my employees well. I have newer machines and I use lavender in the laundry bag or whatever, right? Like, it's not a, a one-and-done type thing. You're, you need to always be continuing to look for ways to increase the value, uh, whether you're going to increase the pricing with your next layer of thing or not, right? And I think, you know, your, your biggest recipe for success is to be charging a high amount, but to be giving even more value than what you're charging, right? And that's where you really have a success formula and that's where you really poise your business to grow and to grow rapidly when you're able to charge top dollar, but provide even more, um, you know, with these little touches and the big touches um, through your service and, and you're set up to be in good shape from that. Brian, do you want to jump in? No, I, I think you're a thousand percent correct. It's not, you can't get complacent with value. It's kind of value in a business is the same thing as fashion. Fashion is never finished. It's always ongoing, newest things, whatever it is. It's the same thing with value where you're always trying to improve upon it, fine tune it and continue to deliver it at that level. So to your point, a thousand percent, that's the route you could go. I mean, unless you're in a market where you literally own the market, you can't just be like a volume person. It doesn't, I'm sure there are people that can, are successful with that model, but I'm in New York, you're in California. It's one of the most expensive markets um, in the country. It's, it's not going to work for me. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. So we have a few more questions that we haven't got to yet. We're, we're, you know, pushing up against it here. So I want to run through these, Brian, real quick. You kind of mentioned about this earlier, but do you charge per, per pound or per bag? For your pickup right now, I charge per pound. I just ordered about 1,500 custom bags from China. And once they do arrive, I will be working to do a per bag pricing. I'm just trying to figure out the marketing around that. But I'll absolutely be moving to that um, very shortly. Yeah. And I know uh, Mark Vlaskamp, who, you know, does he kills it in pickup and delivery. He, he's a big advocate of the per bag Uh and I, I want to say Dave Menz, who's, you know, also killing it, pick up and delivery is a big advocate of uh, per pound. So uh, it's just, it's all about the business model that you want to be running and there's different ways to run it. Uh, real quick, can we just, uh, can we uh, just touch on commercial pricing? How do we think about commercial pricing? It's a little bit different 
uh, than residential. So how do we wrap our heads around commercial property? We could probably do a whole webinar on this one, but let's go high level. And how do you, how do we think about that? Gil, you want to start us off on that? Yeah, I think that, I mean, I think it has to start with volume, right? I think that we have the relationship, the more, the more volume you bring me, the lower price I can go ahead and give you. Cause I can go ahead and process a lot with less labor if you're giving me if you're giving me volume. I've seen a number of different kind of things, right? If someone's doing people charge per napkin, right? There's all sorts of different ways to think about it. And I think it really does go down to like an either an industry specific, volume specific, or customer specific conversation. And I haven't seen one true model, although there are these themes around volume that I see a lot. Brian, any input on that? Yeah, I think it's uh, it, it comes down to two things, the frequency in which they're giving you that order and the size of that order. Absolutely, those two things in itself justify a discount over what somebody that just walks in with a 20-pound load gets. But I think where people kind of steer themselves wrong is that they associate volume or frequency with profit. But if you're giving 40% off, are you really making that or you're just kind of breaking even? I mean, you're putting more wear and tear on your machines. Your staff is spending more time, more time folding versus providing that experience. So commercial could get away with you quick where if you don't know your numbers, you might be losing money on that. You have no idea unless you truly know what those numbers are and what goes into it because folding towels and sheets is a lot easier than folding baby clothes, for example. So you need to really understand how that breaks down from a labor perspective. I mean, I had to get rid of a client that was um, that came to me when I first started using him because I gave him a good deal because I was testing it out. And after like two orders, I ran the numbers. I'm like, listen, pal, this doesn't work. I was like, I could give it to you for, I charge $1.50 in store. I was like, I could give it to you for $1.25 dry weight. And that's what I could do. I give you that every day, give you the 24 hour turnaround you want, but that's my number. And he didn't, it didn't work for him. And I gave away, I think he was doing like close to 10,000 hand towels a week. And I was like, it doesn't, it's not worth it for us. Yeah. So you need to, it's, it all comes down to the numbers. You can't get blinded by, you can't get blinded by the size. Yeah. I yeah. think that's such an important point. Yeah. Yeah. Huge. And you got to know what that cost is for yourself too, and how much it does cost you to process that laundry. And I mean, you alluded to another, uh, another variable, which would be, you know, turnaround time and how quickly they need it turned around. And the other thing that I'll, I'll throw in there, just something to chew on, uh, especially in the commercial is it might be a little controversial, but uh, you know, value-based pricing, you know, how, how much would it cost them to process that laundry themselves? And sometimes mm -hmm. you don't really even need to give them a discount because you can already do it at a cheaper price than it would cost them to do it. So don't give away money just because they're getting volume. Uh, you know, Ask them to do it and be priced accordingly there too. Yeah, I. That's that's no, another awesome point. I mean, certain commercial things you can actually charge more for. I mean, most thing like heavy duty blankets, most places will charge you a fixed price. I have one client that during COVID started a slumber party business. She's crushing. She brings me like eight bags of blankets a week. I actually charge. 50% more for her and she's still getting a deal. So commercial doesn't necessarily mean you're charging less. You could by all means be charging more. If they're getting a deal from it, it's a win-win on both sides. So you don't need to think that just because they're coming to you all the time, they're giving you this all this volume that you need to charge them less. There's certain instances where you could actually justify charging them more. Totally. Because a lot of commercial customers have specific needs, right? They want it to be pressed or they want it to be folded in a certain way. And those are additional services that they're asking for. And you can absolutely charge more, 100%. Uh, one of the key things that, you know, we just kind of mentioned it, Brian just kind of mentioned it, like you got to know the data. How much is it costing you? How much time is it taking? All of that stuff. I just want to transition real quick. I mean, this is a sense webinar and I want, you know, maybe I'll throw it to Gilly. How, you know, how can we utilize software to help us figure out our pricing, uh, whether that's self-serve, pickup and delivery, wash, drive, fold? How can we utilize the data that we can get from using the software? 
uh, to help us with that. You know, what does Sense have to offer in terms of, you know, pricing for, you know, your services and offerings? Yeah, I think it's kind of twofold. One is the mechanics of it, like how are we actually establishing these different prices? You know, like in Sense, you could have a different price as you drive further and further away. You can go ahead and establish anybody in this area will get this price. Anybody really close to my laundromat will get a different price. And that way you can save yourself the gas money that you're, that you're going further and further away. The same thing with commercial customers. You can say, hey, these types of commercial customers are going to get in this tier of pricing. Those types of commercial customers will get a different tier. Or I'm going to make a tier just for that one customer that I have a special relationship with. And so Sense will provide those mechanics, right? But that doesn't give you strategy, right? And I think a big part of this conversation is what, how do we think about strategy? And one thing that Sense tries to do is kind of provide all of that information under a single, a single umbrella, right? We want to go ahead and put you in the command center, make sure that you're sitting there in the cockpit, seeing things clearly about your one location, your 100 locations, doesn't matter what it is. And how do we look at our businesses from a bird's eye view and then make decision about inputs, right? How do we make decision about the prices that we charge? And so whether that's reporting um, or whether that's kind of insights about your, your, your week or your day, um, I think those are things that uh, A, Sense is really, really helping our, our operators kind of make those decisions. And it's also one of the biggest areas of investment for us. Um, it's the area that we're putting some of the, our, our resources right now are going into that sort of focus because we realize how important it is for the operators because they're basically saying, hey, you're my source of truth. How do we go ahead and leverage this even more to be smarter about our efficiency? Because there's so many things changing in the world. How do we go ahead and keep our, you know, keep our focus and make sure we run our business smart? Yeah, love it. And hey, I mean, listen, if you're looking to, uh, you know, add a, a business in a box solution for you, whether that's your self-serve side of your laundromat, your wash dry fold, your pickup delivery, you know, do yourself a favor uh, and just do a demo. Go talk to somebody with sense. Uh, link will be in the chat, I think. Oh, look at that, man. I love the sense fairy that I can make put links in the chat. It's great. Uh, but seriously, go, uh, you know, hit that demo. Uh, you know, it's uh, try sense.com slash demo and uh, <laughs> the little fairy uh, emoji there. Uh, and, you know, go check it out. Go talk to somebody and and, you know, find out if that's something that's going to help you take your business to the le next level. And that's what this is all about. Right. And if sense is a you know, a solution that's going to help you take your business to the next level. If they're providing that value, if they're hitting that mark where they're able to provide more value than, than it costs to you, then it's a no brainer, right? It's a no brainer to take that step. And, and if not, then communicate that with them and let them know what they need to do. Because I know that these guys are committed to, you know, building something that's helping you with your business. And I think that they, I, I, I feel like I could speak for them and say they're going to be disappointed if they're building something and it's not helping you. So, you know, communicate that with them, but go check it out. Talk to somebody over there at Sense, get a demo of that software, see how it works and see how it can help you uh, with your business. I want to say a huge thank you, first of all, to everybody over there in the chat who's contributing. I love the discussions happening over there. A lot of great answers here on the webinar, but also a lot of great input and answers over there in the chat. So huge thanks to all you guys uh, for participating. Brian and Gilly, you guys are rock stars. Brian, we're gonna have to get you on the podcast over here so we can hear more <laughs> about your business. Uh, and thank you guys for taking time out of your day on a, what is it, Tuesday uh, here and uh, you know sharing about your knowledge and your wisdom of this, uh, uh, you know, of this industry and this business, helping people take their business to the next level. Huge deal. Thanks guys. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jordan. Always a pleasure making boring topics like pricing really interesting. Appreciate that. <laughs> awesome. Thank uh, you so much. Yeah, appreciate it. Trisense.com slash demo. Go check it out. Otherwise, we'll see you guys next month in the next uh, Sense webinar. See you guys.